how do you, how do I attract leaders uh, to my organization? Well, it's a great question, and, and I'm going to, in this session, answer it for you. So let's get started. Number one, if you want to attract people to your team, you need to love what you do. Often I say you need to love what you do and you need to be doing what you love. Now, when I'm talking about loving what you do, now I'm talking to you about your passion. And what's beautiful about passion is it truly is the great energizer. In other words, passion gives you energy. If you know a person that's passionate about Zifra and they're passionate about what they're doing, they have a lot of energy. People with passion have energy. People without passion, honestly, they lack energy. So when a person loves what they do and they do what they love, they're filled with passion, which not only gives them energy, but it also makes them attractive to other people. Let me explain. When you see a person that really loves what they're doing, you're just attracted to them. You may not even know what they do, but there's something magnetic about a person that enjoys life, enjoys people, enjoys making a difference, and pretty soon you find yourself literally being drawn to them. You know, I'm 74, and I still work hard and love what I do, and I still travel the world, and I still write, and I still speak, and hey, and I, I mentor you, and I love it, everything about it. I don't want to retire. I don't, I'm not thinking about stopping. All I'm thinking about is what can I do today to add value to you? In fact, when I got up this morning and I thought about my time with you today, I thought, oh, good. I get to add value to you. I get to make a difference in your life. I get to be a, a positive difference in your life. So if you want to attract people to you, leaders especially, you have to be passionate in what you do. That's what makes you contagious. It's what makes them want to do and be what you do and who you are. Number two, you want to be successful. Why? Because success attracts people. Success is what gives you the credibility of being a leader. So let's say, for example, I was putting together a, a sports team, okay? And, and and I was successful myself in 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 soccer or what you may, or football, however, whatever you would call that in your in, in, in your culture. If I was successful, you'd be drawn to be on my team because you'd say, because John is successful as an athlete, I can be successful also. There, there's something about success attracts people. So if I want to do well in leadership, what am I going to do? I'm going to find somebody that's done well in leadership. If I want to do well in relationships, what am I going to do? I'm going to find somebody that really knows how to get along with people. So there is a credibility that you get as a leader when you're successful because people want to follow successful people. And there's an attraction. Leaders like to be attracted with other leaders. I often illustrate it this way. Let's say from a 1 to a 10, 1 being low, 10 being top. Let's say I'm a, um, an average leader. I'm a 5. Now, what does that mean? That means that I will attract people that are 5s, 4s, and 3s, 2s, and 1s. Because the law of magnetism and the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership says who you are is who you attract. So if you're a good leader, guess who you attract? You attract good leaders. So if you're a five average, you attract fives and fours and threes. And we can get you up to a seven or an eight. If you're an eight, what do you, you attract some eights. You see, the better leader you are, the better people you attract. The higher you go, the more you attract people that have already gone high. The more successful you are, the more that you attract successful people. This is huge. People want to be on a winning team. They want to be with somebody that's successful. So when you're successful, you begin to bring around and attract yourself really successful people. Number three, take action. This is what I call action attraction. In other words, there's something about when somebody is moving forward that it's that movement that people say, oh, She's going somewhere. He's going somewhere. Where are they going? I wonder if I could go with them. 
I wonder if I could join their team. You see, what leaders do is they not only know the way, they show the way. In other words, they basically look at the people around them and say, I'm going to climb this mountain. Do you want to climb this mountain with me? I'm going to go to the top. Do you want to go to the top? And it's that action that really makes the difference in people's lives. Again, nobody ever joined a person that just had good intentions. They only join somebody that has good actions. So the moment you start taking action on a situation, you begin to attract those people to you. Now, what are we doing? We're talking about how do you attract leaders to your organization? Number one, love what you do. That gives you passion. Number two, be successful. That draws the best people to you. Number three, take action. Now, all of a sudden, you're creating movement. Number four, have a big vision. You see, the size of the vision that you have determines the size of the person that you attract. If you have a small vision, you attract small people. If you have an average vision, you attract average people. If you have a big vision, you attract big people. I know this because for 50 plus years, I've been leading. Many years ago, I gave a vision that was just amazing. I looked at a small group of leaders and said, let's train a million leaders around the world. Now, when I gave that vision, there were only about, oh, maybe 1,000, 1,200 people that were following me in this vision of training leaders, just a handful of people. But the moment that I gave them what I called the million leader mandate, it brought the best out of people. Let me say this. When you get a big vision for people, it draws the bigness out of it. When you give the best vision, it draws the best out of people. And immediately they said, let's do it. And literally, hang on, in seven years, we had trained a million people around the world. And then I said, let's train people in every country. And the vision got big again. And another seven years, we had literally trained five million people in every country of the world. What was it? A big vision. It draws big people. And finally, if you really want to attract great leaders to your organization, you need to lift your leadership lid. And what I mean by that is very simple. You need to become a better leader. The reason I teach leadership around the world and have for so many years is because when I was in my 20s, I became totally convinced that everything rises and falls on leadership. I was so convinced of it, I said, that's my calling. Here's the good news. 50 years later, I am more convinced of that truth than I was when I started. It's a beautiful thing to give your life to something that you know to be true. 50 years later, I am telling you again as your friend, everything rises and falls on leadership. So if you become a a better leader, if you have a bigger vision, if you take action, if you yourself are successful, and if you love what you do, guess what? You'll attract a lot of good leaders to your organization, and that's what I want for you. I want to talk to you about uh, the the best advice that I ever received, and and then I want to pass it on to you if I titled this lesson. I've never done this lesson. I wrote it just for you, to be honest with you. If I entitled the lesson, I, I would call it the best thing you can do for yourself and for others, okay? When I graduated from college, my father who happened to be the president of the first college I graduated from. I sat down with him. I was getting ready to begin uh, my life, my, my calling. And I asked him for advice. And, and what he told me was the best advice I ever received. And this is going to be the core of the lesson. He said to me, John, if you want to be successful, three things you need to do every day. Value people, believe in people, and unconditionally love people. He said, if you do those three things, you'll always have people follow you. You'll always be a person of influence because it's all about people and people, most of them don't feel valued. Few of them ever have anyone that really believes in them. And he said, hardly anyone has anyone that unconditionally loves them. And I have taken that advice 
value people, believe in people, unconditionally love people. And in every book I write, I take it through that grid. Every teaching I take, like today, I take it through that grid. I continually, continually remember that in everything I do and everything that I am, I value people, believe in people, and unconditionally love them. Now, my father just died July 4th of this year. He was 98 years of age. The day before he died, I, I was with him, just the two of us alone. And uh, we spent a, a few hours together, and I began to talk to him about lessons that he had taught me. In fact, that day on my, on my iPhone, I, I literally would put down a lesson he would teach me, and then I'd say, now, Dad, this is what you taught me, and this is how I've applied it to my life. And there were 29 lessons. The other day, I was reviewing those 29 lessons that my dad taught me. And, and, and I think it's, let me count them on my pad. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Seven of those 29 lessons were about relationships, about either valuing people, believing in people, and unconditionally loving people. And, and I'm going to give them to you just quickly. That This is not the meat of the lesson. My, my, one of the lessons that my father taught me were things such as encourage others, walk slowly through the crowd, see the best in others, remember their names, travel the high road, express gratitude to and for others, unconditionally love them. And when I looked at these lessons that he taught me in life, uh, it, what, what was huge was this, that he understood the value of people, and he understood how to give value to people. Now, there's a relationship, I think, between understanding the value of people and also, at the same time, understanding how to add value to people. I have a coaching company. It's only 10 years old, but it's now the largest coaching company in the world. I think, I think we have like 35,000 members in about 168 countries of the world. So that's pretty fast growing for 10 years. And uh, when we bring these coaches together every six months, we have these uh, major three-day conferences where we especially bring in new coaches, people that just signed up to be part of our team, the John Maxwell team. And we bring them together, and every every time we do, every six months, I have this about an hour and a half lecture called JMT. That stands for John Maxwell Team DNA. And I and I take them through what is the DNA of a John Maxwell Team member because I want them to understand this is who we are. We are creating a culture of people that really add value to people. And the first thing I teach them is this, and I want you to catch it: that we are people of value who value people, and we add value to them. I'm a person of value, but I'm on this teaching call with you today because I value you. I, I value who you are, what you've done. I value Stephen, I value Erica, all, 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 all the people that lead your organization. I value, I'm a person of value that values you. So what is the re best result? The, the best result of all of this is that I add value too. If I value myself and I value you, there's an automatic action that I take, and that is that I value you. And, and the best thing that you can do for yourself and the best thing that you can do for your others is to value yourself, value people, and then add value to them. You, you see, um, I, I wrote another book called uh, uh, Winning with People. And in it, I have what I call people principles. And, and, and one of the people principles is what I call the elevator principle, which basically says uh, we, we either, like an elevator, we either lift people up or we bring people down. And in fact, I could basically summarize any kind of relationship teaching in almost one sentence, and it would be something like this. You and I are either a plus in people's lives or we are a minus in people's lives. We're either adding value to them or, to be honest with you, we're taking a little piece from them. That's just the way it is. And, the, and again, this is huge because what I think about the best thing I could do for myself and the best thing I can do for you is I can value myself and I can value you because if I can do those two things— if I am a person of value and you're a person of value, then my next response is that I'm going to add value to you. So how do I do that? How does that happen? 
So let me give you just my little five set step every day process of, of, of adding value to people. Here we go. Number, number one, I, I value people, okay? I, I go back to the golden rule. You know, treat others as, 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 as I want to be treated. So every day I, I make sure that the core of everything I do is based on the fact that I value people. And the reason that's so important, especially for leaders, is leaders see more than others see and leaders see before others see. And because of that, because I see more than most people and because I see before other people, this gives me a very distinct advantage over other people. Trust me, in life, if you can see more and you can see before, you're going to win the race. So the question is, what do I use, what do I do with that advantage? What do I do with the advantage I can see more and I can see before? I can either use it for personal gain or I can use it for your gain. I can either manipulate you, which means I move you for my advantage, or I can motivate you, which means I move you for your advantage and personal and, and mutual advantage. So, so I'm, I'm either going to be a plus or a minus, and, and I'm going to be a plus or a minus with people based on the fact that I, I value those people. If, if, if I value you, I'm going to be a plus. If I don't value you, to be honest with you, or if I don't even value myself, I'll be a minus. I'm either adding or I'm subtracting. So every day I value people. The second thing I do every day is every day I, I think of, of ways mm to add value to people. In other words, I look at my calendar in, in the morning. I, uh, on my calendar day, in, 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 so what am I doing? Before I ever get here in our teaching lesson, I'm, I'm thinking of ways I can add value to you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking ahead. I'm intentionally saying I'm going to be with you today. What can I say to you that is going to be a plus in your life so that when I'm done, you say, wow, John just moved us a little bit further down the road. This is huge. So, you know, when, when, when I look at my calendar, I ask myself, who will I see and, and, and what can I do? What can I do to add value to you? In fact, one of the things I felt that I could add value to you today was to, to do a, a kind of a unique lesson just for you because I know how much you value people and, 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 and the whole intent of why you do what you do. A few years ago, I wrote a book, Intentional Living, and I was trying to, we have five grandchildren, and I was working on teaching my grandchildren how to be intentional in adding value to people. So I was with, having dinner with all five of my grandchildren, and I was asking them what they were going to do the next day at school to add value to people. And our youngest grandson at that time, I think James was nine, said, you know, Papa, you know, tomorrow when I go to school, I'm going to open doors for people. I'm going to, if I'm near a door and people are coming, I'm going to rush ahead. I'm going to open the door. And when they pass through, I'm going to smile and I'm going to say, have a good day. I said, oh, James, I like that. The next evening, he called me and said, Papa, I had a great day. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, remember I was going to open doors and you know tell people to have a great day. And I said, oh, yeah, I remember it well. He said, well, I did that. I did that all day. He said, he said I, I opened up 47 doors for people today and, and smiled and said, have, have a great day. Now, James is nine, and he's already learning to think ahead of how he's going to add value to people. I want to encourage all of you to look at your calendar what you're doing tomorrow, see who you're going to see, and ask yourself a very simple question. When I'm with them, what can I do that would add value to them? Wow. Number three, I, I, I not only value people and think of ways to add value to people, but number three, I, I look for ways I look for ways to add value to them. In other words, when I'm with you, I'm constantly looking and saying, what can I do right now to add value to this individual? Wow. Because here's what I know. Who I am determines what I see. Just like who you are determines what you see. If I'm a person of value who values people and wants to add value to people, guess what? I'm going to see all kind of opportunities to add value to you. Why? Because that's who I am. I don't see what's before my eyes. There's a whole bunch of things before my eyes I don't see. I see what I'm prepared to see. And, and, and how I view others is how I view myself. Now, this is huge. 
So how do I add? How, how do I do this? How do I look for ways to add value to people? Well, I, I love to play golf when I'm on a golf course. One of my desires is to find somebody that's working the ground. You know, maybe somebody's raking the traps, the maintenance people. And I intentionally separate myself from the other golfers for a moment. I go over and introduce myself, and I thank them for their hard work and how beautiful they make the course. And then I, I, I give them a financial, I just slip them some money and say, hey, take your family out to eat today. And, and uh, I'm, my name's John, I'm your friend, and I move on. If I'm in a restaurant, uh, especially if, I, if it's a single mother or if it's an elderly person, I, I, you know, I, you know, I make sure that I, I really, you know, give them a great tip. In fact, during COVID-19, I, I've, I've done, I, I, I just tip 50% of the meal anymore right now because I know everybody's having a very tough time. Now, now, I'm just, now what I'm just saying is you want to be conscious and look for ways that you can begin to add value to the people around you. These are people I don't even know. In fact, every day I make it intentional that I give something to somebody that doesn't know me at all. I can't benefit at all from them. Okay. The first question I ask anybody that I do know is, you know, well, how can I help you? What can I do? So every day I value people. I, every, every day I think of ways to add value to people. Every day I look for ways while I'm with them to add value to people. And number four, every, every day I do things that add value to them. I not only think and look, but I actually do things. I, I, in fact, I ask myself every night, who did I add value to? And how did I add value to them? And I, and I always have a goal, and this is a simple goal, but it's really good. I, I want to be the first to add value to people. You know, when you're first, you set yourself apart from everyone else. I, I watch people in the crowd often hesitate, and I often think, you know, if you wait till everybody else does something good before you do something good, it's still good, but you get lost in the crowd. Be the first to help. Be the first to add value. I, I try, and, and so I become, I become a person of action. So when I see that there's action needed, while other people are asking themselves, well, do I, well, should I do this? I've already made up my mind because I've prepared my mind. My mind has already been made up. You know, my mentor, John Wooden, used to say, John, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. So I've already made my mind. So every day I value people, think of ways to add value to people, look for ways to add value to people, do things to add value to people. And finally, number five, every day, I encourage others to add value to people. In fact, that's what I'm doing right now for all of you of Lifestyle Publications. I, I, I'm encouraging you to now begin to follow this process because it's, the, it's literally, it's the best thing you can do for yourself, but it's also the best thing that you can do for others. I encourage, I encourage you to be a person of significance, not just a person of success. Now, success is wonderful, it's important, but success is pretty much about me. It's very personal. It's, you know, it's how well I do in life and, you know, how well I provide for my family and my home and think it's all about me. Significance is all about others. And I want to encourage you to become a, a person of significance in, as you're in this incredible world. And I, I want to encourage you to, you know, constantly, intentionally add value to other people. I've known a lot of successful people that were not happy. But I've never met a person that does significance, that literally pours their life into others, that I, I, they, they're, they're all fulfilled. They're, they're all having a sense of inner deep satisfaction because they know it's not about them. In fact, Stephen uh, talked about our training of leaders around the world, and we have a fairly large international presence. And in one of my companies, one of my nonprofit organizations, we, we do transformation through values training in other countries. We're only going to the country when we're invited by the president. We're in three countries now. We're getting ready to go into two more countries. We have 22 presidents that have already requested us to come in to be with them. And so I take my coaches on these trips. These coaches, they, they pay their way because they want to add value to people. They, they want to do what this teaching's all about because they know it's the best thing to do for themselves, the best thing to do for others. And so we go to train these facilitators uh, of these transformation tables. We'll go in in five days, train 20, 25,000 facilitators. And I tell my coaches, I say, okay, now you've come to add value to people. You're living this life of significance. It's a beautiful thing. I said, but let me tell you this, by the end of the five days, 
you'll know that they added more value to you than you added value to them. Why you gave yourself, why you lost yourself in them, you found yourself. And then I make a statement that I want to close with in this teaching. Then Stephen, I think, is going to ask maybe some questions. And, and, and the statement I make is that once I tell my coaches, as, as we get ready to launch the first day, that they're about to do things of significance because it's all about other people. I say, once you have tasted significance, success will never satisfy you. Trust me. Once you've tasted significance, success will never satisfy. Let's go determine how to improve and have a great team. Here is John Maxwell. In my book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, I have one of the laws called the Law of Magnetism. The Law of Magnetism very simply says, who you are is who you attract. Tens attract tens. Eights attract sevens. Sixes attract fours. And fours attract ones. You see, the lower you go, the greater the gap. Always remember that. Remember, the better you are, the more successful you are, the more you're not threatened by other successful people to be around you. But the lower you go, the more the person in leadership wants to have a gap between them and the people that are under them. Doesn't that make sense? So how do you gather better people around you? You don't gather better people around you by saying, I want to gather people around you. You gather people around you by becoming a better person yourself first. Always work on yourself first. Uh, who was it said one time that, that almost all the problems I've had in the life started with me? So if you can just, you know, one person said one time, if I, if I could kick the person most responsible for most of my failures in life, I wouldn't be able to sit down for weeks. Huh? So, so you work on yourself and then you gather those around you. Now, how do you gather great people around you? Okay? I'm going to give you a whole bunch of stuff right now. Very simple. This is kind of team building now. This is how do you gather great people around you? This is, this is, this is very good for, for developing your team. Okay. Number one, get beyond yourself, and beside that, put the word ego. Um, I've never seen people with a high ego that had great people around them. Um, an egotist is a person who is always me deep in conversation. We know them, don't we, huh? Well, you know, let's just talk about me some more. Huh? So if you're going to gather great people around you, you got to get beyond yourself. Number two, you have to grow beyond yourself. And, and beside that, put learning environment. In other words, you have to you have to have a learning environment to gather people around you. Uh, learning and innovation go hand in hand. The arrogance of success is to think that what we did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. Leaders must set the pace as both teachers and learners. And never forget your dual role. We're always teaching, we're always learning. And by the way, what are we what are we teaching? We're teaching what we've just learned. And it never ends. Uh, and, and by the way, the enemy of learning is knowing. Always remember that. When people are not growing and learning, it's because they, they know. They know. That's, a, that, that's bad. The enemy of learning is always knowing. Number three. Now you've got to give beyond yourself. And that right beside that, put this phrase, investment in others. You've got to begin to invest in other people. If you're going to gather a great team around, you've got to invest in them. Time given to leaders grows the organization today. Time given to potential leaders grows the organization tomorrow. By the way, you don't ignore one for the other. You pour your life into the leaders today so you can continue to have the success of the day, but you pour your life into potential leaders so you can have the success of tomorrow. Now, what's that mean? Well, what that means in my organizations I have is that I have to spend a lot of time with the key players. Because they're the, spending key time with the key players multiplies success. You've got to spend time with them, you know, seeing how everything's going. I mean, key players, strategic players. Uh, my schedule gets more and more filled up. Um, with, 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 it's interesting. My schedule gets more and more filled up with being spending time with my key players in my organization. Why? Because I, I'm interested in multiplying myself. And, and that's where it's going to be. If you're going to gather a great team around you, you've got to invest invest in them. Number four, you have to share your dream, obviously. Your dream should be bigger than you. And to achieve it, others must be included. Take that dream and share it with others. Build the dream and they will come, okay? Number five, undergird your dream with strategy. 
by the way, thinking people really like this. <laughs> I've, I've always said, if you can just give a dream and everybody loves it, you don't have very many thinkers in the room. Because a thinker, after the dream's all done, says, and just, excuse me, how are we going to get there? You know what I'm saying? If you, if you don't mind, I see this wonderful cloud out here, but what are the steps to, what are the steps to achieve it? So you have to undergird your dream with strategy. And then you have to fill your dream, number six, with passion. Right, you're getting the picture now. You have to fill your dream with passion. And number seven, you have to recognize the contributions of others. One of the great ways to gather good people, great people around you, is by recognizing their contributions. And recognition should be given, letter A, immediately. The quicker the recognition, the more powerful it is. I always say, do it while the sweat is still on their brow. If the sweat dries off, you can still recognize them, but it won't be as significant as as the, is at that moment. Recognition, letter B, should be in front of others, especially peers and family. And number three, it should be in writing. Notes and plaques have a long life. Uh, now, nothing wrong with verbal recognition at all, but uh, what I have found is a note written to somebody has much more significance than me just saying good job. Uh, you know, it's because because now this is something they can hold with them, put on the put on the bulletin board or something, some something that's tangible that they can take with them. And gathering a great team around you for significance, number number eight, give your team a piece of the rock. Give them a piece of the rock. Say, look, if we do well together, guess what? You're going to get a little bit of the fruit of what we're doing well. And number nine, key positions must be held by great players. If you're going to gather a great team around you, you've got to, your, 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 your key positions have got to be by the tens. Uh, you don't, may not have all tens in your organizations, but your key positions better have tens. We have key positions, and I watch those key positions more than the others. Because if those key positions are, have quality leaders within them, all the rest of the organization will just take off. But you let one of those areas begin to get a seven or a six in there, and all of a sudden you, you've, got, you've got problems, okay? Simple enough. Let's get ready. Grab the pen. Grab the paper. Here is Dr. John C. Maxwell. Let me give you some benefits of building a diverse team. Because there's some wonderful things that happen. Once you, once you commit yourself to diversity, there's some wonderful things that happen. Number one, a diverse team will fill in the knowledge gap. We all have a, a knowledge gap, and that is none of us know enough, okay? In fact, I put in here, it is important to know what you don't know. And know those who do know so you can focus on what you do know. Okay, now that's when you need to look at it a couple times, all right? You need to go over that little statement, but just trust me on this. Here's what I'm saying. There are a lot of things I don't know as a leader. And I depend on people around me to know those things because I don't know them. And I not only don't know them, I don't particularly want to know them because it'll keep me from knowing what I need to know. You have to start with this premise, you can't know everything. So you have to know what you need to know. And what you need to know as a leader are the things that are basic to success in leading. And there are a whole bunch of things that are important to know, but they're not basic to the success of leading. But what you have to do is you have to have people around you that can help you in those areas. And the key is in diversity is that when you get the right team around you, that they have knowledge that you don't have, it really begins to fill in the knowledge gap. So the knowledge gap really gets filled in when you've got people around you that perceive differently, see differently, think differently, feel differently. That's huge. The second thing you fill in with a diverse team is the perspective gap. And let me just take you through this little sequence right here. Because I've got perceive, believe, receive here in the lineup. You can see how this is working. And the, there's sequence I want you to get. What I see determines what I think, which determines what I get. That's a fact. 
Basically what I receive in life has a seed of perception in it. That it begins with perception. And how I see something determines how I think about something that determines most of the time what I'm going to receive out of that. So perception is huge. It's not always reality, but it's huge in how I think and how I act. And so a diverse team will really help us in that process because how do I think and receive differently? Well, I've got to perceive differently. Well, how do I do that? I do that by diversity because not everybody in the room is going to see things like I see things. Number three, a diverse team will fill in the experience gap. Diversity in experience is really essential. And it goes back to the, you know, the proverb we heard, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes has this great quote, the young man knows the rules, but the old man knows the exceptions. And to know the road ahead, ask those who are coming back. Very important experience, fill in the experience gap with people around you. Number four, diversity will allow you and me to fill in the problem solving gap. Because we have, what do leaders have to do? They have to solve problems all the time. One of the things that I found really worked well for me in the problem solving gap, and if you're a leader and you have a team or if you're on a team, this will, this will be some good, I think, practical advice. What I discovered about teams was that there are people on the team that can always tell you about the problem. There are some people, they just automatically find the problem. You know what I mean? They'll just say, let me tell you, there's a problem over here. We got a problem over here. And I got tired of hearing my team talk about the problems. And so one day I looked at them and I said, let me explain something to you. Any idiot can find a problem. So low IQ people can say there's a problem. So if you found a problem, you're not smart, you just found a problem. But I said, it takes somebody smart to solve a problem. So here's what we're going to do. Don't bring a problem to me unless you have three solutions. It was one of the greatest things I ever did. First of all, shut up all the problems. You just had all these whiners quit. You know, it's just wonderful when whiners have to shut up for a while. You know what I'm saying? Gives you peace in the valley for a period of time. You follow me. But here's what happened. It got them on the creative side. It got them on how am I going to fix this side? I mean, what am I going to do about it besides just tell you there's a problem here? Hey, and what would you do? And I found that to be a very helpful thing in dealing with problem solving with teams is just say, hey, please, please, please tell me about the problem. But then how would you fix it? What would you do about it? What do you suggest that we do? What would you do? You see, leadership, let me explain something here to you. Leadership is like a quarterback in football. The quarterback doesn't get paid to carry the ball. The quarterback gets paid to know who to get the ball to. And he gets paid to call the right plays and put the ball in the right hands in regards to what situation they're in. And what I want you to understand about leadership is you got to have a team around you that is diverse, that is different. And you got to know what players to call on because different, different situations call for different players. When I wrote the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, the most enlightening thing that came out of that book, and I didn't, when I wrote it, I didn't know it was going to come out. In fact, I write the book, and then sometimes two or three years later, out pops the, the, the thing that really helped people the most. And lots of times I didn't figure it out. I just wanted to write the book because I thought it would help people. But when I wrote the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, a couple years after that book came out, pretty much everybody began to say, I can't do 21 things well. I, I, when, I, when, I, when I evaluate myself with the 21 laws, I'm not a 10 on all those. In fact, on five of the 21 laws that I, I wrote the book, on five of the 21 laws, I'm average or below average. And that was a little disgusting to write the book. You know, in fact, well, those that I was average or below average, I kept saying, I kept fighting that and saying, they certainly can't be a law of leadership. I do them poorly. Maybe there should be 16 laws of leadership. But no, there are 21. I don't do them all well. And what came out of that book was it's very simple. If I don't do them all well, then I need to find somebody 
that, doesn't, that does well what I don't do well. And I need to bring somebody around me that will complete me, not compete with me. They'll complete me. They'll complement me. And that was the essence of what happened. And that's the value, again, of diversity. Well, that's the value of diversity of teams. That's the value of bringing the people together. Because magic happens when you're secure enough to bring enough people around you that you can add value to each other. Now, well, let me give you one more thought, and that is the, the value of diversity of teams. It fills in the giftedness gap. Because Mother Teresa said it well. She said, you can do what I cannot do, and I can do what you cannot do, and together we can do great things. Hey, welcome back. So glad you're here. Chris, it's good to still be in studio with you. Part one, part two. What a incredible day of learning just for you and I on how to lead. Yeah, and what's been really powerful is uh, even in between this is us having a conversation with our team and talking about what does this look like here? What are the barriers? Have we overcome them? And then now we're going to transition into some of the benefits of, of it. I'm glad you said that because not every time do we get to kind of sit here and do part one and part two because not every time is a series. But uh, in between uh, uh, us recording last week's podcast and then recording this podcast today, we had a brilliant conversation. We're incredibly blessed with a new teammate, Javon. And Javon brought a perspective to us on barriers. And Jake is just a young, cutting-edge artist he performed last night <laughs> didn't invite me that's another whole problem Chris you and I were not we were invited not there, but, so. but our, our team here and the diversity that of our team just caused us to have a great conversation in the middle and today we get to talk about barriers or today we get to talk about benefits yeah. <laughs> we've talked about <laughs> barriers but today we get to talk about benefits and there's this standout statement that we want to deliver in this podcast that says this together we can do great things. John quoted Mother Teresa in the lesson, but it's this idea that we are better together when we focus on what connects us rather than what separates us. And so much of our society is trying to do that. And so, man, I'm excited to get into benefits today. It was Winston Churchill that said, diversity is the one thing we have in common celebrated every day. And I love that. He made a commonplace out of our uniqueness. And everybody that I talk to, no matter what culture, no matter what race, what gender, whatever you come from, everybody wants to continue to own their uniqueness. But they want to be valued with the common. Yeah, And um, so anyway, man, we're in it today, and I'm super excited. Yeah, and I love the fact that we've had the privilege of working with a leader and serving a a leader that for years upon years has has led this way has had diverse teams has worked through the barriers and then we've seen the benefits of that and um, i want to dive in and and get some of your thoughts from a leadership perspective as you now are responsible for leading maxwell leadership and, and carrying this this mantle of where we're going and and one of the things that I've seen as we begin to build this diverse teams is um, I love the statement that John talks in here and he used a lot of, you know, they know that, you know, again, yeah. you have to go back and listen to it. I think it's in the notes. You have to follow it along, <laughs> but there's a knowledge gap and we don't know what we don't know. And oftentimes you and I talk about, because we've been around here a long time and I've been blessed to do that to where we, we feel like we're in a bubble. Yeah. And I would challenge that I think uh, leaders out there, uh, the, the longer you lead, the more in your position, the more you're in the organization, where you're going, we, we get to a place to where we get very comfortable. We become lack, uh, we have lack of self-awareness and we don't know what we don't know. And one of the things that, that you've done as a leader recently is, is begin to build this diverse team and the benefits that we're seeing of that is the knowledge where yeah. John talks about increasing knowledge gap. And I've watched you uh, be teachable. I've watched you be curious and ask questions and in a learning mode. Talk about that just from a, yep. a, a leader standpoint of the things that you're learning, the people you're bringing around you that are helping us as an, an organization fill that knowledge gap. Yeah, you, you, for me, it's really easy. I, 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 going back to something you said, uh, I don't use the word fear often. And I don't know if it's pride. I hope not. I don't know if it's 
my macho way of I want to be seen as a guy of courage, sure, not of one of fear. But very rarely times do I feel fear. But I'll tell you in leadership, there is one time that I constantly fear feel fearful about, mm. and that is that I'm missing something. Yeah. What's it like to be on the other side of me? What are my blind spots? Yeah. What am I missing? What What is it that I need to know that I don't know? I mean, these are questions that plague my mind quite often. Not not, not always in a healthy way. So right. I, I'm not I, I'm not going to teach you on how to have healthy fear right. and feeling like you're missing something. There's sometimes I feel like I'm missing something and I'm not, and it paralyzes me just like fear does. But this idea of uh, the knowledge gap. What I am enjoying most about leadership now is when I walk into a setting and leaders have already thought about the next step, and I am surprised. Probably this was most illustrated at the recent event that we have. We have It's called the International Maxwell Conference. Uh, we had over 2,000 people there. We were certifying to be one of our uh, coaches, speakers, trainers. And in fact, if you want more information, you can go to maxwellleadership.com and you can find out more information on joining our team of certified members and, and be a part of that. But um, we were at this event, Chris, and we're, we're rebranding. We're doing some really cool, exciting things, and it's, it's a big deal. And I showed up that morning, and my, my executive assistant, she said, hey, you've got to be at a staff meeting at 7.30. And I said, a staff meeting? My staff meeting. She said, because some of the stuff you're communicating at 9, 9.30 needs to be communicated at 7.30 to our team. And we've got swag and we've got gifts and we got all this stuff. And I went, who thought of all this? It was yeah. this perfect euphoric moment for me of how the knowledge gap translated to culture building team dynamics. And for years, I have felt like those ideas either had to start with me or come yeah. through me. And this particular time, I was just showing up and it was brilliantly done. And that knowledge gap, to your point, of people knowing an even better way and not feeling like as the leader yeah. that I had to deliver that was a real cool experience of the diversity of thinking in the knowledge gap because we have products of the product leading. And you you, you wouldn't have even maybe thought or known to do that. Correct. Right? I wouldn't have. That's, not, that's not how I'm wired. And so the fact that uh, we now have team members that – you know, are thinking outside of, of experiential things that we would yeah. um, is just a benefit of that. And I love that app story. Now, moving right into uh, this next one that I, I want to talk about. You and I were talking about as we were getting ready to kick this off. We were like, man, I don't think I've heard John talk about that before. So so podcast listeners, viewers, this this may be something new right off yeah. the cuff right here that John John is teaching. But if we're going to have people on our team that are diverse and are bringing things to us that – um, that we don't know, and it should be that way. Uh, what we've got to do is we got to make sure, hey, now we're going to hear a different perspective on things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the statement of uh, make sure that we are learning the, the perspective of others in all situations as a leader versus just stating your own truth, right? So right. make sure that, hey, they have the knowledge. Not only do they have the knowledge, but we need to understand their perspective. And John lays it out here with these three words that yeah. we were talking about, the perceive, believe, and receive. As a leader, talk to me about the impact of that, because that, that kind of struck you when you listen to John talk about that. Yeah, and so you always talk about perception. Perception is reality, right? We've heard, oh, perception is reality. Me and my wife disagree about that statement all the time. She says, no, reality <laughs> is reality. I don't care what your perception is. I go, yeah, but your perception is real. And so we, we have this By conversation. the way, Stephanie wins. Yes, exactly. Yeah, every, right, every time. Right, let's, right. Make really, let's make that really mm -hmm. clear. So this idea that John is helping me, what you see determines what you think, which determines what you get mm. out of life. And I don't know, Chris, I told you before we, we started recording, I went, I want to just go and spend a couple of days on how John yeah. li listed out the, the perceive, believe, and receive components of perception. It, are those the three building blocks? Because I do absolutely believe that what you see determines how you think and how you think determines what you receive in life. I get all that. That statement is brilliant. But how that is really the three building blocks or components of perception. We talked about Stephanie. Now let me talk about my daughter, Macy. Macy's a driven, driven girl with a lot of strengths and intelligence and things. Just ask me. I'm her dad, yeah, right? So, so she's Good. got a lot going for her. 
I'm watching her perception. Last night at dinner, I was working with Macy on her perception right before big key test. She gets all these people that wants them to help her to help them by sending her completed work <laughs> right before the test, right? Sounds like John paying people to do his homework, but that's all. By the enough. way, those that aren't watching us on YouTube, you need to because there was a little air quote. Oh, yes, there thank you. Thank that you. Mark just saying uh, there might be a little bit of. Sorry. But yeah, video <laughs> podcasters, uh, you, you caught that. Thank you for yeah, making that yeah. true. Yeah, that, that might be a little bit, quote, air quotes. Might be a little like John getting some assistance with his homework. <laughs> but I was telling Macy, I said, Macy, you can either be celebrated or are rejected based on your skill set. Mm. If you have a skill set and people want it, whether you help them by sending them free your test results or your test preparation or not is not the point. If you are lamenting the fact that people are coming to you because they recognize your strength of intelligence and preparedness, you will then begin to be ostracized or looked at as a, a, a challenging teammate or schoolmate because you're not, you're not open about it or appreciative of it. Because she was telling me one of the comments she sent back to them and says, we're not friends. I, this is the first time you've ever texted me. We're <laughs> friends, right? And we were kind of laughing about it. And I said, Macy, don't despise your giftings. Yeah. Embrace them. You still don't have to give out the answers if people you don't or it gets you in trouble and all that stuff. But don't despise your giftings. I was relating with her, if you'll allow me to do that. I said a lot of times right in a critical time in my leadership, it seems like everybody needs something from me. This person texts me. That person texts me. I get a phone call. And it's not that I don't enjoy those, Chris. You need to call me more. <laughs> we travel all the time, get to come to the studio and get to see each other. But um it's not that I mind the calls. It just feels like it floods me on the days to where I need this kind yeah. of focus. And by the way, I'm covering my eyes, yeah. listeners. And yet that's when it feels like everybody's demands on me. And the days that I respond and go, man, can anybody not do anything without them is the days I'm despising the strength of leadership. Perception, mm, what you see determines how you think. How you think is what you get. On the days that I don't really see good. that as a gift... And I think people are just can't do anything without me. It'll drive frustration. I get that yeah. frustration from yeah. a very thing that I have prayed, sought, and trained myself for for years is to be the go-to person. Yeah. And we can despise it. And that's a perception issue. That's it's really not a reality good. issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you just took the benefit of having a diverse team and talked about how if you're not careful, it can then overwhelm you and become a frustration. And then what happens? You ignore all of it. So then you're throwing out the benefit right. of having that diverse team. And so be aware of that. I, I love how you talked about that. Now, this, this, I want to move to, because we'll spend some time here. This is something that uh, you and I growing up uh, around this organization and the environment know we were just smiling as John was talking about this problem-solving gap. Yep. So the benefit of having uh, people that solve problems differently, that think differently, that have different perspectives, um, is that you're going you're gonna to have the opportunity with uh, the help of solving problems. By the way, a good friend of ours, Carly Fiorini, defines leadership as solving problems, That's right? That's exactly right. And so she literally talks about, hey, you are a leader if you solve problems. Now, we have a diverse, diverse team that um, will help us solve problems. Now, that's great, right? But John laid out an incredible system of how to have the team respond to the leader uh, in solving problems. We're not there yet. You and I talked yeah. about that. We're not there to where you have modeled that in uh, your leadership, but John, and yet we've got some growth to do. As a leader, talk about the power of that, what's yeah. brought to you, what that does for your thinking, what that does for the culture of our organization. Yeah, and, and I will. And you know, I, I envision our podcast listeners and perhaps video viewers, um, I envision you like grabbing your pen and paper and then John gives all this content and then you're kind of sitting back and saying, let's see how Chris and Mark can mess this up in the society. <laughs> That's kind of my vision of you sometimes. <laughs> Forgive me. I, I believe in you a lot more, but I kind of yeah. feel like we provide the things not to do and yeah, what John says exactly you need right. to do. That's right. That's right. Grab your pen and paper though right now because this is going to be a moment to where I want to mature this, this fill in the problem solving gap. That's good. Because John said he... He, he got so frustrated with people bringing problems, bringing problems, bringing problems. Finally, he said, don't bring me a problem again until you bring me a solution. When you can bring me three solutions, now bring me your problem. 
He said, it's not that I didn't want to hear the problems. I like hearing problems. I just want solutions with it because my team kept making their problems my problems. Okay. I've taught about that before, but I'll tell you, there's a maturation. There's a maturity to that, that John and I have developed in my last 12 years as a CEO that I want to show you the, the additional components of that formula, let you take notes on it. And then Chris will talk a little bit about how our team is still trying Love to it. mature into, into this that. problem solving gap. So again, problem, it, this is John's words. I kind of cringed when he said it. He said, any idiot can identify a problem. <laughs> and I went, I'm the idiot that's identified yeah. a lot of problems for yeah. John. Present, tardy, guilty, yeah. whatever. Any person should be able to identify problems. In fact, some people, the question is, is you, are you identifying the right problems? And is your problem really a problem? Or are you making it a problem? We got all that. Yeah. But there is a problem. And for John and I, I saw pretty early on that what I identified as a problem, John said, yep, we've got a problem. So now I had to get good at coming with solutions that felt good for how John would solve things. So then I went through a maturity on solutions, uh, solution suggestions. And I, I got better. And so I would come to John and say, John, here's the problem. He'd go, yeah, we got a problem. Here's the three solutions that I've come up with. Man, Mark, that's three good solutions. But now let's mature this a little bit further to where he would ask, what's your recommendation? So we go from problem identification, solution suggestion, to now solution, uh, uh, um, solution su suggestion, to now my suggestion. What is my personal preference on the solution we should go with? Solution selection, maybe. And I would look at that, and I would say, this is the one I think that we should go with. And then he would say, why? Mm -hmm. So there's, your, there's the complete formula. A problem identification, three solutions. Recommendation. Option Love of it. recommendation. And now, why? That's good. And what happened in the why, Chris, is John could determine two things. Because he said often, Mark makes 97% of the decisions in the organization. What he wanted to identify in the why, and we as leaders need to identify, is why. Have you properly thought it through? So it was a, a question of preparedness. The why was a question. Is Mark prepared when I ask him why? Secondly, it was a, it was a question of passion. Was I passionate about my suggestion? So he was going, does Mark have the tenacity to see the solution through? Mm. And then it was a question of accountability. Is Mark accountable to something in the why that will hold him true to That's this good. being the solution to go That's through? Good. And so if we can see this, experience, this problem-solving gap through the lens of a true, tangible thing that we can process our people through. So now back to John. John and I have talked a little bit about that from stages in, in different countries of how we have led together so well. I feel like with John and I, at least, we're getting an A on that, on that whole gap right there. We've done really good with that. Well, then you said, well, how do you think the team's doing? And I went, yeah. oh, that might be a C, and that might be a generous C. We're not there. So leaders, vulnerable moment. I'm doing a better job of providing that than replicating it. Now, the question I've got to ask, because right now I feel like I have a lot of problem identifiers, a few solutions, but no ownership to the solutions. Yeah. And I've got to work to mature that in a reprodu reproducing mindset because while it feels good to say John and I are nailing it, it does not feel very good to me to say myself and our team are not nailing that. Yeah, yeah. And appreciate the vulnerability. I, I, I went back and thought about even some conversations where I can see you beginning to model that uh, even in our, our, our relationship and our leadership to where you're like, okay, no problem. What do you think we ought to do? And... Do I have three? Maybe, maybe not. Do I have two? And then you go, why? And, and, and so I hadn't thought through the process. And I think it's a great model for leaders to understand that you are going to have people on your team. This is an incredible benefit that are going to think about problems differently than you. They're going to be able to identify them. They're going to think about solving them differently than you. And so as they do that, they may be able to solve them better than you. And that's awesome. That's why they're on your team. Now, but, before you go further, let me tell you this. I told you last week that I was going to talk about something I observed in you that was a benefit 
this is where I want to serve it. So all of you that tuned in this week to say, good grief, does Chris bring a benefit to the table? I got to tune in. Here, here's your moment, okay? <laughs> and seriously, Chris does not even know what I I'm going to say. We, we have not had one conversation about this, no. but me and Matt Reardon, our new COO, have had multiple conversations about this. Matt doesn't know mine and your history of saying, Chris, I got to hear you. I got to know what you're thinking. I've got to have your authoritative voice in some situations. Yeah. He wouldn't know all of that. I've never shared it with him. Doesn't matter. I've shared it a little bit on the podcast. We've laughed about it. We were in our last leadership meeting a couple of weeks ago, and, um, and I watched something unfold in our meeting that didn't make sense to me. There was this branding decision about some blogs and how we were going to do our social media and all of that. There was this conversation that came up, and I'm watching our leadership team wrestle with something. And I'm just kind of listening, taking note. I hadn't been in many of these meetings back to um, our first knowledge point of, gap. of the knowledge yeah, the gap. Of I'm it, not yeah. in a lot of these. And, and so I watched you guys just kind of wrestling with it and kind of stayed silent, made a couple of comments about, yeah, the team really needs to be agree with this. And then all of a sudden, your voice comes piercing through the conversation and said, whoa, guys, half of this conversation has been revisiting a decision we all collectively made a few weeks ago. We're talking about the wrong thing here, what we need to be talking about, and then you went on to what needed to be talked about rather than what was being talked yeah. about because of that authority. Matt Reardon, our new COO, came to me afterwards and he said, you cannot know what it did for that room, Mark, and even for mm. what I'm trying to influence the team with when Chris went, we've already talked about this. We are process. Now, you're a, ver you're a, you're a private Pro processor. Processing. You're a processor, and you do it internally for the most part. I watched you on something that had already been processed through as a team, which we want to be collaborative. I watched you stand with, a, you didn't stand, no. but I watched you insert yourself with authority and say, we've already talked about this. We've already agreed. We're talking about the wrong thing. This is what we need to be talking about. And for many, for the people that was trying to revisit it, perhaps to try to see if they could convince somebody with a little more authority to <laughs> see their way, <laughs> to change we it. don't know why. Right, right. But what we do know is every person in the room benefited. It was a benefit of your processing perspective to come in and say, we've already processed this. We decided quit revisiting what we've already processed. Let's move forward. When you allow people that know how to problem solve, that have giftedness, that has the experience, that has the perspective and the knowledge, the safe place to use their voice, the benefit will move the ball forward for who? Every Everybody. one. Yeah. The detractors were shut up because they'd already had a chance to talk about it. The people that were not yet mature enough to have confidence to say we've already talked about it were edified because they had already done all the preparation to have it. And then you moved us through to where we really accomplished something in that segment. And it was this moment to where I went back and relived all of our funny conversations and went, wow, that is the benefit. Uh, you, you, sometimes you process slower than me. Sometimes I process way too fast for you. Mm -hmm. But allowing both of us to sit on the same leadership team, it was an epic moment in your leadership because people that have no idea what we've t been through, yeah, talked through, yeah. sit around tables discussing, have no ideas, they just went, Oh my gosh, something was said in that moment that nobody else in that room could say because you had a voice. Well, I appreciate that. Isn't that, that true, we, though? That, it's very true. It's very true. And you're true. surprised with that observation because you didn't even know I, I, I yeah. observed all that. And, and the benefit of that as um, th the topic today around the diversity is I just think differently. You do. And, and I process differently. And I was listening to this conversation and just to our mentorship and coaching over the years, used a time in the meeting to use my leadership voice of what felt logical to me right. and where I was at. Was and so powerful. again, that's just an example of, and I appreciate you sharing that, but it's an example of having the, a diverse team. Um, again, back to what we talked about, like we love the fact that, that John has taught us, and this is what Maxwell leadership is about, that we want to value all people um, and that we want to value them equally in a way, no matter where they come from, the nationality, the gender, the leadership experience, but to use people's gifts and how God created them uh, to be able to impact your organization, to be able to help lead your organization. And by doing that, you're going to have people that are going to help you solve the problem that sh the problems that show up inside your organization. And if you can take the model that Mark just explained to us 
and begin to live that out and begin to teach it in your organizations, you will see the lid lifted and you'll see the benefits of having people that think and solve problems differently. Absolutely. Well, today's topic is titled, you may not be trusted as much as you think. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> I definitely think this might be an intervention. It's an intervention. I was going to say, like, I think you're paying me back for last yeah, week's right. uh, podcast where I tried to call <laughs> you out all a little about bit me. on there. It's all about you. <laughs> Uh, but talk to our audience a little bit about what you're thinking here in regards to this. Yeah, fantastic. Been uh, teaching lately on leader credibility yeah. and love it. Just love thinking how do you increase your credibility as a leader. Uh, and one thing that's just a key piece of that is trust. It's, it's the linchpin of everything about your leadership. Uh, actually, I'm reading a book. Um, I've been reading a lot on trust, but especially one I enjoyed was from someone I had worked with over the years, years ago, uh, Dr. Joe Folkman, and he worked with Jack Zinger, and they have a lot of, they do a yeah, ton of together. research. Yeah, yeah so um, they, uh, Dr. Folkman had a new book out called The Trifecta of Trust, and uh, in that book, by the way, the trifecta was uh, displaying expertise and good judgment will build trust. Uh, demonstrating consistency will build trust, and uh, building relationships will build trust. But that's, you can get that from the book. One thing he said, though, that captured my attention was that you may not be trusted as much. 45% of leaders in his research wow. are not trusted as much as they think they are. And he said there were seven signals that would indicate, and maybe we should pay attention to, that would um, indicate how much your level of trust, or how you could deteriorate your level of trust with your team. So I thought we'd cover the seven signals and uh, highly recommend the book Trifecta of Trust by Dr. Joseph Folkman and uh, see what you think about these things. I think as leaders, we, uh, because of the intentions we've had, we have, and, and Perry and I've talked about this with the intent versus perception gap as a communicator, that we tend to overestimate the amount of trust mm -hmm. that we have as, as you're talking about here. And I think that's a, this is an interesting conversation because for us, we believe that leadership is influence, and we believe the, the currency to all influence is, is trust. Mm -hmm. And um, I think also when we talk about in our teams, people are like, I need more engagement from my team. And then that 45% you just shared, I was like, okay, that's a big part of an engagement level with our team members. And at 45% don't feel like they trust their leaders, there's a big problem yeah. when it comes to getting our our teams engaged. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation because this is a little bit of a different, not, not spin on trust, but a little bit of a different perspective on leaders. Remember anybody that has influence as a leader overestimating yeah. the amount of trust that they might have with yeah. their people. Well, I figure I'm not lying, cheating or stealing. I must be trusted. Right. That's well, right. There's a thousand little things that make that up. So, uh, I'll give you the signal and okay. kind of what it means, and then maybe you could comment yeah. on that. But uh, by the way, I put this all in the learner guide, so there's going to be seven of these, and there's some details. So go ahead and get the learner guide. It'll help you with that. But signal one, failure to exercise hmm. good judgment. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Folkman says that um, uh, are others confident in your ability to make good decisions uh, in that we inaccurate judgments that we think that, well, I'm the boss. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the person in charge. I'm, I make all the decisions. Yeah. And do people actually have confidence in your ability to make those decisions? Yeah. One of the things that uh, Folkman says in his book is that too often leaders assume that their position, positional yeah. leadership yeah. qualifies them to make critical decisions where they may not have the best data and insight. And this goes back to how we teach influence and leadership at level one, where because it just says it right there, they have that position. They're making some crazy judgments, crazy decisions, and your team sitting back going, he or she has no idea what's going on. They That completely is not the right decision. And so your team loses confidence in you, and you're, you're basing that off of the fact that because you have the title, because you have a position, you're qualified to make that decision. And that's not necessarily the best judgment. What I... What I love about um, a collaborative leadership style, ultimately, listen, when you're leading, you're responsible. It's your decision to make the final decision. Mm -hmm. But man, you want to up your level of trust with your team is to involve them in that conversation. What are you seeing that I don't see? What's your perspective? How can I make a decision here? You don't, listen, leaders, you don't have to have all the answers, right? You don't have to make all the decisions without people being able to speak into that. Now, there's a, there's a cap on that. You don't need to get too many things in your head, but you definitely um, need to improve the way that you're making decisions and your judgment. And by doing that, 
you will increase yeah. the trust that your team has in you and your judgment. Yeah, I love that. Inviting uh, a shared voice, inviting others to speak into it. Uh, we talk a lot about vulnerability, uh, and vulnerability builds trust. When you show yeah. the three most unused words in leadership, I don't know, yeah. uh, to say, uh, what do you think? And inviting that for decision. Okay, signal number two, uh, Dr. Foltman says, hypocritical behavior. Uh, he says, are you a role model, or could actions sometimes be in in interpreted as hypocritical uh do you set standards and then ignore them do you mm. you know the, it's better for for thee but not for me that type of a thing what's your view on that one so what we're talking about here what we're talking about here is really um behavior we, and we talk so much about behavioral change and we're in the behavioral change business uh and we want to have our behavioral change at times we want to always be growing always be learning and one of the things that, that bothers me, and I see it in leaders uh, ar around the world, I'll give you just a very simple example. This is corny, but you say, hey, I'm a servant leader. And then you pull into the organization and the, the front parking spot says Perry Holly, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. you know, versus whatever it might be. And I think it is, there's no doubt that leadership is contagious. And we talk about that people are watching you all the time. And you need to be aware of that because when that is happening, um, you, you, people are watching you. And then if that does not align with your audio, people are going to be like, well, listen, Chris is over here doing this, but he says this, so it might be, it must be okay to do that. Right. And a lot of us are so, we learn visually. And as leaders, we need to be aware of that um, to make sure because people are going to be watching us. And if we're not aligning what we're doing physically with what we're talking about audibly, then we're, we're not going to have any credibility. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to have any trust. They're not going to trust us. My son owns a Chick-fil-A restaurant, and I asked him, what's your biggest leader lesson so far? He's, he's doing mm, that. And he question. said, what he said, uh, how much easier it is to ask someone to clean the restrooms when they've seen you clean the restrooms. Yeah. And he said, it's a, you know, it'll be hypocritical for him to say how important the restroom clean is and how we got to clean on top of this. And by the way, you go do it. I don't do it. Yeah. He said when he got in there, when they see him in there doing it, that they all realize that that's, that's not hypocritical behavior. Yeah. That, that's really. One you know, other comment too, that mm -hmm. this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is there are things as leaders of teams and of people that you will have never done before. But you're going to go ask somebody to do it. And, and that's okay. There are going to be situations like that. What bothers me about it is they go, well, it shouldn't, it's not very hard. It shouldn't take you but about 10 minutes. Go. <laughs> and so although there are times that I'm not going to have experience in something that I'm asking a team member to do, the way that I talk about it, the way that that's I right. approach it needs to be so. Now, if there's a chance for me to roll up my sleeves and get in there, man, it's the first thing I want to do. Like you, a great yeah. example of your son. Um, but if there's not, what I want to encourage you so that you don't break their trust is, is don't make assumptions as you're communicating, asking them to do something that you have no idea how long it's going to take or how hard it is to do. Hey, podcast listeners. Do you have a clear plan for growth? Achieving big results most often does not require big life changes. Small improvements over time compound into big results. Download the Maxwell Leadership app. It's the new free app where our expert guides and John Maxwell help you pace your leadership journey and set a clear plan for your own personal growth. You can also find all sorts of resources on the Maxwell Leadership app, including this podcast, information on upcoming events, and much more. Just search Maxwell Leadership in your app store and download the app today. Signal number three. From uh, Trifecta of Trust, Dr. Folkman says, inability to show consistency mm -hmm. and honor commitments. Uh, do you say one thing and do another? Uh, do you make promises and you don't keep them? But that inconsistency and really how easy it is to say, I'll get that to you. I'll, I'll be right. I'm, I'm going to look into that. And then you don't. Uh, it's, it's like you're not lying, cheating, and stealing. Yeah. Nope. But you're not keeping those small commitments that I think other people keep track of those things. Yeah, we, we talk about um, being aware of how you make others feel, mm. right? And when it comes to commitments, and, and Folkman says in his book, you know, it is easy for us to, to say we can do something, but while we may forget about that commitment or forget about that, those that we make commitments to, even though it may be easy, if we don't follow through, they always remember that because it's how we made them feel by not 
following through, not having um, consistency when, when it comes to that. And it's so important for us as we develop trust to have consistency. The other thing here that we, I, I'd love to talk about is I think leaders are missing an attribute of being consistent in order to increase your influence mm. and to increase your trust because you have to be at a place to where your team, for the most part, knows what they're going to get. Because if they don't, they're coming in with walls up, right? They're coming in where like, how's Perry going to react to this request? Or is he going to kind of yell at me through this? Or, you know, I, I was talking. Which to, version shows up. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. I, I was talking to a, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who is in the cybersecurity world and he just changed organizations and uh, he changed from a, a, a big, big, big firm to a smaller boutique firm but it's still a decent sized firm. And I said, how's it going? First couple of weeks. And he said, man, you know, what's amazing is that what is happening with my leader on team meetings and product rollouts is so consistent across the two weeks that I've been there to what they told me in the interview process where people are not screaming at each other. The leader's not yelling. Mm -hmm. I see this consistency of this behavior and it's so refreshing to me. And I was like, man, that's awesome, right? Like that's, yeah. that's something that I think as leaders, we need to be thinking about. And so not only consistent with emotions, but then your follow through to his point, like, you know, people will not forget your commitments, uh, that you have not followed through with them. And so make sure that you're, you're being very intentional about that. Signal number four, as a reminder, these are seven signals that you, that might break trust. You might not be trusted as much as you think you are. Number four from the book Trifecta of Trust is neglecting relationship building mm -hmm. practices. Uh, do you make an effort to stay in touch with the issues uh, or concerns of other people? Uh, are you the last to know when other people are having problems? I often write about this. There are people telling you bad news. Do they feel safe coming to you? Do you have that relationship? Um, do you know people on a personal level, that sort of thing? Yeah, when it comes to relationship, for us, I immediately go to, you know, level two influence in the five levels of leadership, which is the foundation of everything that we teach it, with our clients and with our partners on helping them develop leaders and shift culture inside their organization is to understand that common language. Level two influence is the foundation. John calls it relationships as well. And if you don't get this right, if you skip mm -hmm. over that, what we see in a lot of organizations is we see a, a, a high turnover number. Um, we see a, a lot of uh, lack of engagement because people come in with a title, they go right to production and they never build relationships or connect mm -hmm. with their people. And I think this is the foundation. Now, I also want to make sure you can understand, you can interchange the word relationships with connect, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people go, I don't want to build a relationship with Perry because <laughs> I think it's this warm and fuzzy. But there are ways for you to connect with your team members in a way uh, that allows you to build trust with them and you're not neglecting them. Mm -hmm. And so there are all kinds of creative ways. Projects connect, adversity connects, um, data connects, whatever it might be. There are ways for you to be able to connect. And a lot of people uh, neglect that. And in turn, there's a lack of trust. Then there's a lack of engagement. It just kind of rolls on down the hill. Well, I think about it, too, that we talk about you you – you may climb the levels of leadership on the five levels, but you never leave the previous mm, level behind. That's good. I think I've seen many leaders that go, whoop, so glad that relationship building's I'm over out. so we can get down to business. Yeah. You're thinking, no, no, that's what's happening here. The trust begins to fall away when you, yeah. you don't know me personally. Yeah. Uh, signal number five, lack of technical professional expertise. Uh, pr expertise about your profession. Are you competent in the role? Uh, or are you out of date with uh, certain aspects of your job? Are you keeping up? Uh, to be an expert in the space that you're leading in. This is uh, reminds me of a comment that John says, and he'll say some really funny phrases sometimes. And matter of fact, I've even heard him say where sometimes he'll create words just because he wants them to be in the dictionary, <laughs> even though they're not words, and then they end up in the dictionary. But he always used, he says this about, especially with technology, but also even just leading people in the, the world we're in right now, fast is faster than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And because of that, as leaders, we need to make sure that we are always growing and that we are always learning and that we are bringing trends, we're bringing thoughts, we're bringing ideas to the team that we are learning as leaders because then that's going to build that's going to build trust in the team versus if we don't to your point have a and we have a lack of that and things are changing at such a fast pace then your team's 
they, they're not going to buy into that. They're not going to do that. Again, I'll go back to the statement of leadership is contagious. And so when they see you doing that and you don't have a lack of it, when, then you're going to find them going, hey, I was reading this article the other day and I thought about you here. Right. And all of a sudden you create this environment and this culture of learning uh, with a with a kind of a growth mindset. Back of that teachableness we talked about. Yeah, yeah. Signal number six, are you avoiding collaboration and cooperation? <laughs> are there groups or individuals in the uh, in your space that you're uncooperative with? Are people, do you have conflict, unresolved conflict uh, with other people in the organization? So you're viewed as being maybe disconnected mm. with the par- other parts of the organization. Yeah, I, I think when, when it comes to this, um, you want to definitely be collaborative. We talked about that a little bit earlier and, and get cooperation. What I want to encourage you is that, that that doesn't mean that this is not going to come without any tension or without any conflict. It, that is going to happen, um, but you got to handle it the right way, right? you got to be able to say, no, 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 I'm going in this, and I want us to collaborate. I want to hear your voice. They want to feel heard. I want to know what your perspective is on those things because, again, then you're connecting with them, and I want to encourage you not only to be doing this within your team, but I would also encourage you to be doing this with cross-functional teams to begin to, to, to kind of spread your influence and your thoughts to bring other people into this so that you really are getting a collaborative approach. But then make sure, again, you, you take the time to make sure everybody feels heard. There's going to be tension. There is going to be conflict. But the challenge is not to just let it sit there. Right. And to, to, to work through that, make sure we're not avoiding dealing with that. And I'm not saying go out there and stir up conflict. Um, I know some of you listening are like, that's your favorite thing to do. It's not my favorite thing to do. Um, but you got to be careful of, of how you do that because it's going to happen. Tension's going to happen. And you just got to, you got to manage that and you got to, and you got to, you got to lead them through that. And when the, your team sees you doing that, they're definitely going to increase their trust in you. Signal number seven, uh, absence of communication. Uh, do you keep your team well informed? Do people know what's going on? Are you talking about progress and changes and new directions? Are you letting are, are people being surprised on your team or do you keep them well informed? Well, as we wrap up, this is uh, this is something that's personal for me because I always feel like I can do a better job of it. And what's interesting is that some people on your team want to know everything. Now, they, they, um, maybe it's not the right time for them to know everything. As a leader, you're going to know some things before your team and all kind of stuff. Other people, they don't really just care. It's like, hey, give, what's my job? It's, we're good. <laughs> and you got to understand how to lead all of them, yeah. right, and communicate to all of them and, and communicate the proper way. There's different forms of, of how people like to receive information. But when they are surprised, um, there's a problem. As, as a leader, when they're surprised, they will not necessarily trust you. And I, one of the examples I think about is, again, I'll use an example Mark Cole has taught me, which is when you're getting ready to go in and have a tough conversation or communicate with an individual, um, if they're surprised by what you're about to tell them or the hard conversation you're going to have, or th- th- this is you know, in a conflict situation or a tough conversation, but this goes for even just regular communication. You know, hey, Christmas party is, you know, Tuesday, you know, December 6th. And all of a sudden it's two, the 4th and I'm just now telling my team there's a problem. Right. There's a problem there. They're, they're not going to trust me. But when they are surprised by any type of information, it is a decrease in the trust that they're going to have with you. My last comment is, and I love this quote. And this is from, I think, Greg Cagle, the first time I ever heard it, was authenticity is a trust accelerator. Mm. And so everything that Perry just shared with us and the Folkman's seven things he brought to, if we will just be authentic as leaders and not try to, to, to look different or communicate different or do things differently, and we'll just be authentic, that trust, they're going to feel that. They're going to know that, and um, they're going to increase their trust with you, even though you think you have 100% of their trust right now. To Perry's point and why we're having this podcast, that's not the case. Right. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results.